Good morning. Well, this is an awesome experience already. I haven't been in a drum circle in probably, how old am I? Probably 15 years. So that was an exceptional experience this morning, which I'm very grateful for. And I'm also really grateful for the invitation to be here and to speak to you about this issue of all of these chemicals that we're exposed to. And the title of this talk, I'll explain it about the third slide in, um, why I titled my talk this way. I would like to start by mentioning that I received funding from the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. This is my disclosure statement. Um, we live in a chemical stew. I'm a scientist, I have a laboratory, there are chemicals in my laboratory, they're all exceptionally well labeled, they all come with instructions on how to handle them and interact with them so that we can protect ourselves from them in the lab. My students wear lab coats and gloves and safety goggles and respiratory masks when necessary so that they aren't harmed by those chemicals. But you are living in a chemical stew and you probably are not even aware of all of the places that you are receiving exposures to chemicals. So you can think about what you did this morning when you got ready to come here, and probably most of you between last evening and this morning showered, and you probably used personal care products. <clears throat> and when you think about how many personal care products you used, and I would ask you to put up how many fingers of different personal care products you use, most people will start with like this, right? Until I tell you, oh, your toothpaste counts, and your deodorant counts, and your shampoo, and conditioner, and soap, let alone any cosmetics you put on, maybe a body lotion, it's very dry out, I smothered myself in baby oil this morning. So you start to think about all the different things that you put on your body this morning without even really thinking about them. You maybe rode in a car this morning and you were breathing in chemicals that were being released from the upholstery and the plastics inside of your car. Maybe you ate out of a disposable food container. Maybe you ate something in the back of the room which surely was packaged. That food came from, hopefully, a crop at some point and that crop was probably treated with chemicals either to prevent it from being eaten by pests or to keep um, other weeds from growing alongside whatever it was that you're eating. And when we start to think about all the different things that we do to clean our environments around us, to have green lawns, to have perfect looking apples, we start to realize how many different chemicals we came in contact to today and how many of them ended up in our bodies. When we actually go and look in the bodies of people, we find dozens or hundreds of chemicals in their bodies. And studies that have been done on pregnant women have shown that these individuals have at least 45 chemicals in their bodies and sometimes more than 100 chemicals in their bodies and of course those measures are limited based on what we look for. There's something like 80,000 to 120,000 chemicals that are approved on the market in the US. We don't know very much about most of those chemicals. So I titled my talk the way that I did because I once was giving a talk like this to legislators. And this gentleman said to me at the end, but we're all exposed and we're all fine. And I thought about it and I said, well, you know, I have one head, I have 10 fingers, I have two legs, which I am fortunate for, but we're not all fine. If you think about the kinds of diseases, uh, Lily's introduction, talking about the kinds of conditions that sometimes affect some um, populations more than others, we are not fine. When we look at actual disease trends, and of course there are debates about how we've changed how we detect diseases, or we changed how we diagnose children with ADHD. But still, even considering these changes in what we think about disease or how we go searching for disease, we are seeing increases in the incidence of all kinds of diseases, many of which have a hormonal basis. One of my great heroes who passed away this year from uh, lymphoma um, 
Dr. Lou Gillette, who is one of the leaders of the world in looking at environmental toxicants and their effects on wild creatures. Um, if you Google him, you will see a picture of him and you'll say, that's a man who wrestles alligators, and his job is to wrestle alligators. Lou Gillette, back in the 1990s, testified in front of Congress, and he said, probably one of the rudest things that has ever been said to congressmen, gentlemen, you are half the men that your grandfathers were. And the question is, will our children be half the men that we are? And he was talking about declining sperm rates. And it got a lot of attention, particularly because the audience was mostly men. And the field has continued to debate what that means. We're all fine. Look at us. We have a population incline in the world. Why are we worried about fertility rates? when there's so many humans around us. So we start to think about the cost of these health effects, the cost of infertility to couples, the increase in conditions like infertility, and that that's a cost that is, that is born by the people who suffer from it. So I'm gonna to talk today about endocrine disrupting chemicals. These are compounds that are found in a variety of sources, industrial chemicals, personal care products, various pesticides that are applied to our food and our yards, as well as the way that we package the things that we interact with. And there are a lot of different definitions for what we mean when we're talking about endocrine disruptors. And I like this definition because it's the simplest. These are chemicals or mixtures of chemicals that interfere in some way with hormone action. Most endocrine disruptors that have been identified to date are chemicals that either bind to a hormone receptor and mimic the actions of a normal hormone or somehow mess with that uh, hormone receptor to prevent the normal actions of hormones. But endocrine disruptors could alter how hormones are synthesized, how they're transported in the body, how they're metabolized, how they're excreted and removed from the body. And there are examples of all of these. So why does this matter? When we think about the endocrine system or hormones, which most of you, I'm guessing, don't do every day, we normally think about reproduction, you know, the fun part of hormones. The, the fun end, at least when you're young. <laughs> but the endocrine system has such a bigger job than simply reproduction. The endocrine system plays an integral role in helping develop the creature. It plays an important role pretty much from conception through the aging process until death. And individuals who are developing as embryos who are either in a womb or in an egg, or in something like an egg out in the environment, use the endocrine system in order to tell their organs what to become. And when we fiddle with that process, we're basically, basically fiddling with the underlying basis of the development of the creature. And we know that we're very sensitive to hormones during development. This is a great example. Women take birth control pills, which are synthetic hormones, in order to not get pregnant. When a woman takes a birth control pill, she stops ovulating. But when she stops taking birth control, she ovulates again. Otherwise, women wouldn't take birth control when they were young, right? This is called an activational response. The body is activated to respond to that hormone when it's present, and it stops responding when you remove that hormone. This is entirely different than what happens if you're exposed in the womb. The developing creature, oh, I did it. The developing creature here, here, if it is exposed during the development of its organs, it will actually change the organization of those organs. This is called an organizational effect of hormones. And the reason why is that there are cells in the body that are like stem cells that get signals from hormones that tell them what to become. And if you mess with that signaling process, you can change the developmental trajectory of those cells. And usually we're not talking about something as, as drastic as being born without organs. Instead, we're talking about subtle changes. 
sort of like if I told you to get on a boat at Boston and to take that boat to London and you were off by two or three degrees. Not such a big deal until you realize now you have to speak French. And here's a quote that came also from one of my heroes who uh, also passed away this past year, Dr. Theo Colborn, who's a leader in the field of the study of environmental chemicals um, and an um, environmental conservationist. And she said, from the day of conception until an individual is born or hatched, because Theo likes birds and reptiles, the development of each stage of life is fully under the control of hormones. Changes that happen during development are far less reversible than those occurring in adults. You can't go back and rewire the brain. So when we expose creatures during early development, including humans, we're creatures too, we send them down a developmental trajectory that we can't pull them back from. And again, these can be very subtle changes that might not even be visible when we're born, but can lead to increased susceptibility to diseases or the actual disease themselves. And this has been referred to as the developmental origins of health and disease. This is a field that originally studied, uh, started with the study of um, synthetic hormones like diethylstilbestrol, a, an estrogen that was actually prescribed to women during pregnancy with the idea that if some estrogen during pregnancy is good for you, then more must be better. And women were prescribed diethylstilbestrol in order to help prevent them from having a miscarriage. It didn't actually do that. Their babies were born looking normal. And it wasn't until they reached puberty that those young girls started to be diagnosed with a very rare cancer of the vagina. When they reached the age that they themselves decided to reproduce, they found that they were infertile. A lot of them had abnormalities of their reproductive tract that you would never detect until you were trying to get pregnant yourself. And of course, those women had to wait until later ages before it was determined that they were actually at increased risk also for breast cancer. So in early life, chemical exposure can contribute to diseases that don't manifest until later in life. But if we look at those individuals at birth, we're all exposed and we all look fine. And of course, when we're exposed to chemicals really does matter because our organs are developing at different paces and different rates. And what I really love about this figure is that it points out that there are big parts of our bodies that continue to develop once we're born. Our brains continue to develop until about 20 or 25. Those of us who work with college students understand this. In the 1990s, this concept called the low-dose hypothesis proposed that endocrine disruptors could have effects, especially on reproductive and developmental endpoints, at low doses. That uh, these effects would be likely to be seen at doses similar to what humans experience, and that humans, being the animals that we are, would also be affected by these low doses. Now the problem is how do we study these low doses? In particular, how do we look at the kind of chemicals that are found in our personal care products and in our food and in food packaging and in upholstery if all of us are exposed, right? Who do we compare ourselves to any longer? It's not an easy issue to get at, but we decided in 2012 to revisit this concept of low dose, the low dose hypothesis, which I would argue is not a hypothesis anymore when we have literally thousands of studies in support of it. And the reason why we decided to revisit it was because there are now hundreds of epidemiology studies comparing individuals who are exposed at higher levels to those exposed at lower levels. And they're seeing adverse health associations with exposures. Now, they're human populations. They're associations. And you've all heard correlation is not causation, right? And so we have to get at a better understanding by going and looking at animals that are exposed to controlled doses. So I'm going to give you two brief examples of low-dose effects that I think are really sort of fascinating examples. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of these myths that persist when we talk about endocrine disruptors. 
The first example comes largely from work that was conducted by Tyrone Hayes, who's a scientist at UC Berkeley. If you're not familiar with Tyrone Hayes' work and also these sort of terrible um, climate in which he has had to do his work, I strongly suggest that you Google Tyrone Hayes, The New Yorker. And if you want to ask me about this, I'll tell you a little bit of his story at lunch um, because uh, he's a colleague of mine and it is an incredible story. And it really gets at the heart of why working in environmental health as a scientist who also believes in environmental justice can be very difficult. So atrazine is a chemical that is widely used and it's used in, on corn crops. Um, it's an herbicide, and you can see from this map here that it's widely used in what we call the heartland of America. Why? Because that's where corn is grown. And atrazine can alter this enzyme called aromatase, which is used to convert testosterone, often considered the male hormone, into estradiol, the female hormone. And Tyrone uses um, frogs for his study, and he uses frogs that typically only the females have this enzyme. So the females make estrogen, the males do not. And just for clarity's sake here, looking at these um, creatures, that's the female, she's nice and big and plump, and this is the male, okay? Tyrone first showed that really low levels of atrazine could alter the voice box in the male frog. And that's important because the male frog needs to be able to call to his mate. He next showed that the gonads of these creatures were also affected. That when you look inside the testes of males, you'll find eggs. And Tyrone, if you haven't heard him speak, if you ever get a chance, go. He gives a great talk. But he tells this story that basically is, his wife said to him, the most painful thing you can experience in life is childbirth. And he believes her, but he thinks passing an egg through your testes might be second. <laughs> so he found that these frogs that were exposed to extremely low doses of atrazine, if they were males, they would have intersex. So they might have a, a testis and an ovary, or a testis that had parts of ovaries within it. And just so that we understand what doses we're talking about, these are part per billion doses, and three parts per billion is what the EPA says is safe for us. So he's seeing effects far below that. Next what he did is he took animals that had been exposed to atrazine, and I know most of you probably don't look at blots like this, but basically you're looking for a little line and that will tell you that the creature is genetically a female. So here he has creatures that were exposed to atrazine. They look like females on the outside, but genetically they're males. Okay, so next he opens them up. I apologize, some of you who aren't biologists are gonna be creeped out by this picture. This is a genetic male, he opened it up. It has ovaries that are full of eggs, that's what you're seeing here. And then he wondered these genetic males that look like females, will they act like females? And these are two genetic males that are mating with each other, they're actually brothers. And they can produce live offspring. These animals were exposed to one part per billion atrazine, and three parts per billion is what's actually approved and is safe. Now, this is not work that is uh, only Tyrone's. That's sort of what his challengers would say is, here's some guy, he's an extremist, he, he's, you know, he has something to prove. And again, I suggest you read the New Yorker piece. Um, this is work that has been shown. These are um, sections of testis from various different creatures, from mammals to fish. Here's the frogs and a reptile. And uh, effects on the testis are seen across classes of creatures, which um, is providing support that this is not something that is specific to frogs and certainly not specific to uh, wildlife. The chemical that I spent um, now a little bit more than a decade studying is bisphenol A. When I first started doing this, I would come and I would explain to people what BPA is. Now you all know, um, mostly because you probably have bought a water bottle that says BPA free on it or some consumer product that says BPA free. BPA is widely used in consumer plastics, 
but it's also used in epoxy resins, so the kinds of things that line food cans. Also in things that are epoxies like paints, um, things that help hold water pipes together. I should probably change this picture since probably half of you don't know what that is. BPA got a lot of attention when it was detected in baby bottles. And the reason why, so you've probably heard of BPA, you may have no idea why are we so worried about this chemical. The reason why is that in the 90s, it was understood that BPA could act as an estrogen. In fact, this was known in the 1930s. Back when DES was being developed as a pharmaceutical, that synthetic estrogen that I told you that we gave to women under the idea that if some estrogen is good, then more is better, BPA was tested at the same time. It was put back on the chemical shelf because DES was considered a better synthetic estrogen. But it was known in the 1930s to be an estrogen. Sometime in the 50s started being used in uh, plastics and other food contact materials. Just in the last few years, we're starting to realize how many other things it's being used in. Thermal papers, your receipts um, contain BPA. And a colleague of mine was giving a talk at a university and someone uh, raised his hand and said, what happens if you burn thermal paper? And my colleague Pete Meyer said, why would you burn thermal paper? And the kid sitting next to him said, he rolls his joints in thermal paper. Apparently it sparkles. Please do not try this. It is an unintended exposure. You should not be breathing in the huge, tremendous amounts of BPA or BPA replacement materials that are being sprayed and are readily absorbed from those thermal papers. And I'm very happy to see walking across Northeastern campus that you're a smoke-free campus. If you needed another excuse to quit, cigarette filters also contain BPA in addition to all of the other nasty things that are in cigarettes. If you are a smoker, please don't stop using a filtered cigarette for this reason, maybe just quit. So we started studying BPA and its effects on the female um, using a mouse model. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of mouse mammary glands, which I know you don't normally look at, so I'll explain what you're looking at. We think of the mammary gland in a mouse as being a wintertime tree. It's mostly just the branches of the tree. And that's what you see here. It's a little dark in here, but mostly you're seeing the branches of a tree. And when the creature gets pregnant, you start to see leaves on those trees. And as pregnancy progresses into lactation, it looks like a summertime tree full of leaves. And those are the structures that actually produce milk. We see leaves in our BPA exposed animals. And if you take this to a veterinary pathologist, they say, oh, it's early pregnancy, except that it's not. This is a creature that was exposed in early life in the womb to very low doses of BPA. In mice, we see precancerous lesions in these animals. And in rats, you can get ductal carcinoma in situ or frank carcinomas. So just plain cancers. BPA also increases the creature's response to chemical carcinogens. So if you expose them in early life to BPA, and then at puberty or early adulthood, you give them a tiny dose of a carcinogen, which doesn't induce tumors in most unexposed animals, suddenly you can get tumors in the BPA-exposed creatures. So I just want to talk to you about some of the truths and myths, because just as you probably get most of your science information from um, the public press, we read the public press too, and usually we're so frustrated that there's some just misperception when we're talking about environmental chemicals. And a lot of these truths are myths. I use BPA as an example, but they apply to other environmental chemicals. So a lot of people think, just eat healthier and you won't be exposed to BPA. And that is probably true that you can reduce your exposures to BPA by eating healthier. But there's two things to remember. Number one, you cannot avoid this chemical. So this is actually work that was done at Silent Spring Institute. It's called an intervention study. So they have the individuals live their normal lives. Then they cook for them, so they're not eating canned foods. Then they go back to their normal lives. And what do you see? Exposures to BPA go down. So eating fresh foods will decrease your exposures. Do they go away? 
No. You're being exposed from other places than just food. The second thing to keep in mind, and I think that this audience is, this is going to make absolute sense when I say this, not everyone has access to fresh food. And we have to remember that, that when we say, this is so easy, just do fill in the blank, that we're assuming that people have the access and the resources and the funds and the education to do that. And while I am a bench scientist, I do not pretend that what I do doesn't impact how people make choices. And we need to understand that as much as people might try to make the right choices, sometimes they can't. And if this is a choice between eating canned vegetables or no vegetables, we want people to eat the vegetables. What we don't want is that by choosing to eat canned vegetables that they're exposed to a whole host of chemicals that they had no idea about. This is also data over here looking at exposures from thermal paper. A few years ago, we had no idea that BPA was in thermal paper. Didn't mean it wasn't there, we just didn't know. These chemicals get put into consumer products and no one has to tell us. And then scientists like me and some others in the audience have to go out and figure out where exposures are coming from. Silent Spring published a study that showed that there was BPA in personal care products. We had no idea prior to that study that we would even look for BPA in personal care products. So am I telling you behavioral changes don't matter? Absolutely not. This is a study that was done at Harvard where they took undergrads and they told them, during this period of time, drink all of your cold liquids out of a polycarbonate bottle, which contains BPA. And then during this other period of time, drink all of your cold liquids out of a BPA-free bottle. And what do you see? Differences in one consumer change. One thing changed exposure levels in those individuals. The argument that I would make, though, again, is that not everyone has access to these changes. Not everyone has access to a Whole Foods grocery store to be able to buy pesticide-free foods, and not everyone can afford to buy pesticide-free foods. So we need change to come at a much higher level. This is a great example, I love this study, of how change can come at a higher level. These are the levels of BPA in college students that are separated based on how much um, canned drinks they consume. The study was done in Japan where they drink canned tea and coffee the way that we drink canned soda. And so these individuals reported drinking more canned drinks and these individuals fewer. And what you can see is the more canned drinks, the higher your exposures. Then the manufacturers changed the composition of the lining that comes in contact with the liquid. And what happened? Woo! Now it doesn't matter how much you're drinking those drinks. Still a whole bunch of people that drink a lot of those canned drinks and their exposures are not higher. This is not something that those students were aware of. They didn't do anything. They were living their normal lives and exposures could be reduced. Okay, the next myth. But there are so many studies that don't show effects of these chemicals. Now, that's maybe not even a true statement. There are some studies that show no effects of these chemicals. In 2005, uh, Claude Hughes and Fred Vamsal looked at all the studies on BPA and separated them out into do they show effects of harm or no effects of harm. And what they found is that uh, about 90% of the studies suggested some harm from BPA exposure. I redid that count in 2011, I think, and the number was virtually the same. It's still about 90% of studies suggest harm. But look at who is funding the studies that show no harm. And the same has been done by Tyrone Hayes when it comes to atrazine. There are lots of studies that show no harm of atrazine. Many of them are being done by companies that have a financial conflict of interest. And we also have to look at those studies that show no harm and ask, are they being well done? So in the case of atrazine, when you dig into those studies that show no harm, you find that actually some of them 
they accidentally exposed all of the creatures to atrazine. So there's no negative control group to compare them to. That's why we do animal studies, because we can say you're exposed and you're not. We can't do that with humans. So it, it, same thing with BPA. The studies that show no harm, sometimes they can't get DES to cause harm. So if they can't get DES to cause harm, which I hope you all know is not a nice chemical, something is wrong with those studies. We have to dig in a little deeper. So when I talk about this and I talk about conflicts of interest, I always get the point, but everyone has a conflict of interest. You, Laura, you must publish how dangerous a chemical is. Otherwise, you won't get a grant or you won't get tenure or you won't be able to publish. No one wants to hear no ships were lost at sea today, right? Well, the answer to that, in my opinion, is this. I am trained as a biologist. There is something else that I can do. I don't have to show that a chemical is dangerous. There are a lot of chemicals to pick from. In fact, I have found chemicals where I don't see an effect on the tissues that I'm interested in, the mammary gland. So we don't keep studying them. There's nothing interesting there. But I don't need to publish that things are scary in order to have a job. There are other things that we can publish on. I'm a developmental biologist. I'm interested in how your body develops. And I can keep my job by doing that kind of work. And most of us can. Another myth. If we eliminate these chemicals, it means we will live in the dark ages. There's a study that was done by Russ Hauser at the Harvard um, School of Public Health where he looked at two different hospitals and babies in the neonatal infant care unit in two different hospitals, Hospital A and Hospital B. And one of those hospitals had taken steps in order to reduce certain chemicals in the neonatal infant care unit, phthalates, BPA. And then they compared what the exposures were like in Hospital A and Hospital B. Same level of care, infants at the same level of, um, of needing help and intervention, vastly different exposures to environmental chemicals. So it can be done. It does not mean, and I am not advocating, that we go to the dark ages where we'll all have to eat rotten apples in order to survive. That's not what we're talking about here. If you want to know which is hospital A and which is hospital B, you can't find out. Because of course, no hospital wants to be known as Toxic Hospital USA. So one of the things when I talk to my uh, chemist colleagues that I hear is, but BPA costs pennies per pound, and we will never find a cheaper replacement. And when we think about chemicals and replacing one chemical with another, what we don't want to do is what we've done with BPA. All of those things that say BPA-free, what do they probably have in them? BPS. And BPS, a few years ago, there was a published study, the first study that showed that BPS is an estrogen. And a reporter called me up and he said, Laura, I'm not a chemist, but wouldn't you think something called bisphenol S would act like bisphenol A? And I said, Brian, I'm not a chemist, but yes. The problem is that a lot of these chemicals are very inexpensive. They cost pennies per pound to make. That doesn't mean that it costs pennies per pound to use. If we're all bearing a health cost of being exposed to these chemicals, we're bearing the cost, right? The uh, Endocrine Society, led by a group um, uh, by Leo Trasande at NYU School of Medicine, just started a project where they're trying to determine what the actual cost of exposure to environmental chemicals, particularly endocrine disruptors, are. And in the EU, we're talking about somewhere around 150 to 250 billion dollars, euros, billion euros a year in health costs from endocrine disruptors. It does not cost pennies per pound. And if we changed how we externalize the cost of those health effects, we would change this triangle. Animals aren't people. So you study frogs and you study mice, and what could they possibly tell us about ourselves? Because remember, we're all fine, right? The answer is the same companies that create chemicals are also creating drugs. And they have to test those drugs on animals. So when a company argues that an animal is not good for telling us about the toxicity of a chemical, an industrial chemical, but is a fine model for testing something that they're going to market to as a pharmaceutical, you can see there's sort of a, a disconnect here. 
And probably the better argument for using animals, and there are problems with animals. Mice are not a perfect replicate, and in fact, that's why we should look at a whole bunch of different animals to get a picture. But mice and rats told us what we should look for in human DES patients. They predicted that we would see breast cancer. We just had to wait for those women to reach the age where they would actually develop breast cancer. The animal models told us that we're going to see effects on the DES granddaughters. And in fact, we're starting to see that in the human population too. Okay, now you get to hear, in case you haven't thought this was political science enough, a little tiny moment of politics. Why do we keep doing this? And this is a quote that probably you're all familiar with. It comes from tobacco industry documents. Doubt is our product since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. It is also the means of establishing a controversy. Big Tobacco used this for decades to continue to sell their product. And that changed in most of your lifetime, that changed. And many of the same PR firms that work for Big Tobacco, they work for Agra, they work for industrial chemicals, they work for the American Chemistry Council. It's the same stuff being recycled. And we fall for it hook, line, and sinker because we're still talking about all kinds of myths that they can create. They can move the goalposts so that scientists like me continually run to catch up and kick the ball and then the goalpost moves again. This is an actual advertisement I'm going to show you. Plastics, an important part of your healthy diet. You could think of them as the sixth basic food group. Don't read the middle part lest you fall for it. Plastics, one part of your diet you may never break. So I'm going to finish with take home messages. We live in a chemical stew. We have to stop pretending that we aren't affected by it in some way and instead come up with better science to understand and prioritize which chemicals should be, we be worried about, which chemicals can we not live without, and start thinking about, for those chemicals that we're worried about, how do we remove them and not create haves and have-nots or exposed and exposed nots. We should not just dismiss exposures because they're low. Our understanding of hormones is that they act in the part per billion and part per trillion concentrations. Some of these chemicals we're exposed to in the part per million concentrations. And if part per billion doesn't mean anything to you, we're talking about the equivalent of a teaspoon of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That, those are the kind of levels of hormones that can be active in our body, and chemicals too. Change has to come at all levels. This is not something that should be a burden on the consumer, his or herself. And the issue of endocrine disruption absolutely is a scientific uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, it's one that, in my lab, we're focused on understanding the nitty-gritty mechanisms that they, work, that, that they work. But conferences like this are very helpful because they help us to transcend the science, to talk also about policy, economics, and the humans who are actually affected by these things. So I'm going to thank you and leave you with my favorite Calvin and Hobbes.
or is there a state which has done similar? It's a good question. So um, different countries have rules about how they um, pass chemical laws. So it, the EU is a great example. The EU is supposed to have sort of blanket chemical laws, but BPA in particular was banned from food contact materials in France, and it has caused an uproar in the rest of the er European Union about whether France is legally allowed to ban BPA and food contact materials because they're supposed to be covered by European law. Uh, countries like Israel, and actually a lot of smaller countries, generally don't have their own um, infrastructure to make risk assessment decisions. So they'll follow the decisions of larger countries, which is why, once again, the U.S. has a unique responsibility because others are looking at what we do. Our Canadian neighbors to the north have restricted BPA in um, some children's products, including baby bottles. And they did that years before the FDA restricted the use of BPA in baby bottles here in the U.S. The FDA's restriction of BPA in baby bottles in the U.S. is not because they're concerned about its safety. They restricted BPA in baby bottles because the industry was getting tired of having to travel from state to state or county to county or town to town because Boston City Council considered banning BPA in baby bottles. And it was a burden financially on industry. So industry wrote to the FDA and said, we've abandoned the use of BPA in baby bottles. Please regulate it so that we don't have to keep traveling from place to place to defend ourselves. Now, if you go to a dollar store, I would bet money, and I don't bet because I'm risk averse, that you can find a baby bottle with BPA in it because they're, they're still on the shelves. They're just not being sold in the places where wealthy people shop. Another question? Yes. Hello, hello, I'm Lisa Sonich from Clean Water Action for many, many years. Yes, hi. One thing that I have in my head from something that I found myself saying to people that I think I um, took a piece of information that you said some years ago and then morphed it in my head, and I want to get it accurate again. Okay. This might find it useful, is that not only is it that low doses can cause harm, but they can sometimes be more harmful than higher doses. Is that accurate, and if so, can you explain it? So I would say yes and no. So we talk about this concept of non-monotonicity, U or inverted U-shaped curves. So think about this. If I told you that more cake gives you a worse stomach ache, you buy it, right? And more and more cake gives you a worse stomach ache. But what if I told you that a little bit of cake, you'll feel fine, a bit more cake, you'll feel terrible. And then a lot of cake, you'll feel fine again. You think that's crazy, right? And yet, this is how hormones work. So if we look at the response of the mammary gland, at low doses, you get growth of the mammary gland, and then you stop seeing growth because you can't have only mammary tissue, as much as some people might think that that's the case. And then with higher doses of estrogen, you actually get less mammary tissue. So we see this with hormones, we see it with endocrine disruptors. The word worse is the problem, right? Because when we're looking at chemicals like BPA, at really high doses, it just kills you, right? Or it causes you to lose your body weight or your ovaries shrink, right? So is that better or worse than having an increased susceptibility to breast cancer? I don't like to sort of think in that way. So, so if we're talking about a single endpoint, you can have this U or inverted U-shaped curve. If we're talking about sort of globally low doses versus high doses, we're never exposed to the doses that kill. We're just not. They're tremendously high doses. We're exposed to the doses that increase our susceptibility to disease. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Zagadeh Shongwe. I'm from South Africa. I'm the Harvard Fellows School. My question is not scientific, but when you uh, have the slide up on UPA and the sources of UPA, you also show um, an open mouth with wisdom teeth and a sprinkler. And maybe I just missed what the solutions are saying. Yeah. So BPA is actually used in some dental composites. Um, it's, it's actually not BPA itself. It's a, it's a big, complex molecule. But if the molecule itself is not polymerized all the way, meaning think about a brick wall, if it has loose little bricks around, those loose little bricks are BPA. So during the placement of um, dental sealants in children, you get a spike in BPA in their urine. And it's thought that that should go down very quickly, but there are a handful of studies that have been done by dentists 
that have compared children that received dental sealants versus um, children that received amalgam um, dental, so like the, the metallic looking ones. Um, they had assumed that the metallic um, uh, sealants would actually be associated with um, adverse outcomes, and it was the opposite. So the, the more BPA-treated surfaces in your mouth, the, uh, the more likely the children were to have behavioral problems. Okay, let me start with the second one because the first one's a funny story. So the second one is um, a glass and stainless steel. Glass is inert. It's a natural product because um, it comes from sand, so glass is probably your best choice. Stainless steel sometimes can have a coating on the inside. There was actually a scandal with these BPA replacement um, water bottles that came out just as sort of the hype about BPA was starting. And they actually, a lot of them had an epoxy resin on the inside that leached BPA. So that's not true of all stainless steel products, but it's true of some. The dented can thing is a weird question because uh, it, it generally doesn't have anything to do with BPA. The concern about dented cans is that you could actually have a small puncture and then you could end up with a foodborne illness from that food. And what the industry has said is that without BPA, we would all die of botulism and listeria and other foodborne illnesses. And I was in Maine when there was a there was a legislative um, battle going on about whether they should ban BPA in certain children's products, and someone from industry made this argument that without BPA in the lining of cans, then we would all get food poisoning. And the uh, main EPA board is actually staffed by citizens. So there's a history teacher, and there's a retiree, and there's a microbiologist. I had researched the main EPA board. The people from industry clearly had not, so they were claiming that uh, botulism would survive because there wouldn't be BPA during the punctures of these cans. And the microbiologist said, but uh, botulism is an anaerobic bacteria, meaning it doesn't need oxygen, meaning as soon as the can is punctured, you wouldn't get botulism. So how does BPA help there? And he said, you should Google it. So, so the dented can is a concern about food poisoning, not a concern about BPA. This is going to be our last question. Thank you so much for answering all of our Yeah. Yeah, thermal paper. So thermal paper is is pretty much every paper we get out of cash registers these days, unless you're still getting the yellow, pink, and white copy. That's carbon paper. Um, thermal paper is used for receipts. It's used for train tickets. It's used for plane tickets, and it's used because the chemicals sprayed the, directly on the paper, and it reacts when heat is applied to it, which is why it changes color. And it's why sometimes. You ever go to a grocery store and they use their finger to try to circle something on the thermal paper? They're using the heat of their own finger to activate the BPA or BPS on that thermal paper. Um, you're exposed to that by handling the paper. And, and whereas your water bottle is probably leaching a couple nanograms of BPA at most, tiny, tiny amounts, that has micrograms to milligrams, like drug quantities, sprayed on the surface of the paper. There are a handful of studies that have looked at cashiers. Um, one looked at students who volunteered to act like cashiers, and their exposures before they handled the paper and after were entirely different. Their exposures fell up. There are a few studies that have compared people based on their profession and people who work in retail um, that handle, uh, including those who report that their cashiers have higher BPA exposures. They're not tremendously higher as you might expect, but they are higher. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And uh, let's give Dr. Laura a round of applause. Thank you so much.